Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to this morning's Ask ICAST webinar. This is, of course, the weekly series of webinars that gives you, the members, the opportunity to find out more and ask questions from the in-house experts here at ICAST, and even on occasions, some of our guests on a range of topics. I'm David Mingus. I'm the Director of Practice here at ICAST, and of course, it's my great pleasure to be guiding you through this webinar this morning. I do have to mention, as we do always, that uh, right at the top of this, this webinar, of course, will provide a general commentary on the topic under discussion. And uh, as always, we expect our members to use their own professional judgment and seek other appropriate professional or legal advice uh, when it's appropriate to do so in relation to the matters under today's topic. Well, I guess who would have thought that on the 23rd of March last year, when furlough was first announced, that we would be having a significant focus still on the need to continue to support business almost a year down the line. The COVID-19 business support in the form of the Coronavirus Job Retention Scheme and Self-Employed Income Support Scheme has now been extended on numerous occasions and up until yesterday it was due to end on the 30th of April. Today we'll look at the latest developments in this area uh, following the Chancellor's announcement yesterday. Today I'm delighted to be joined this morning by two of my ICAST colleagues. Uh, first of all, Justine Riccamini, uh, who is our Head of Tax, Scottish Taxes, Employment Taxes and the ICAST Tax Community at ICAST. Justine represents ICAST at several HMRC and industry forums, including HMRC's Employment and Payroll Group, and is a member of the Scottish Tax Policy Forum, which is a collaboration between ICAS and the Chartered Institute of Taxation. Also joined today uh, by Jeremy Clark, who is uh, my colleague in practice support. Jeremy is the Assistant Director in practice, and Jeremy has significant experience in providing advice, counsel and support to members in practice, particularly around all aspects of practice management, including succession planning, practice m &As, staff issues and strategy. Both of them will be well known to those of you who are regular viewers with our Ask ICAST series. Uh, so welcome to both of you today. Just a few housekeeping matters uh, to remind you of uh, before we uh, continue. You can of course submit questions uh, at any time through the Q&A facility, uh, which can be accessed at the bottom of your screen. Uh, questions can be submitted anonymously or only for the presenters if you wish. We obviously won't identify who questions come from, so please don't feel shy about putting your questions in. We are of course recording this webinar and we'll make it available for on-demand viewing afterwards in case you want to refer back to it or share, with it, uh, share it with others. And of course the slides for today's webinar will also be able to be found alongside that on-demand video. Both the recording and the associated downloads will be available at icast.com forward slash webinars and we'll aim to have that up for you within the next 24 hours. Everyone on the webinar is of course automatically muted so please again don't be concerned about any background noise wherever you are. So as I say we do look forward to receiving your questions throughout the course of the webinar. But before we get into the meat of today's topic, I thought it might just be worthwhile taking a few minutes to cover briefly some of the, the wider coronavirus business support measures that were announced in yesterday's budget and to look at some of the additional measures uh, or some of the additional detail contained within the budget documentation and the red book, etc. So uh, if we start, first of all, in terms of uh, restart grants, um, these will be applicable only in, in, in England. Um, so the normal restriction grants will end at the end of March and from April uh, they will be replaced by restart grants. These are one-off grants um, for various sectors as they are allowed to reopen and restrictions are lifted. Uh, so for non-essential uh, retail, which is expected to be one of the first to open, these will be opened and a one-off grant of £6,000 per business premise uh, will be uh, allowed for, for, for that. And later on, as hospitality, accommodation, etc. opens up, leisure, personal care and gym businesses, um, they will be uh, given a one-off startup grant of £18,000 per premise. As I say, the, these are grants that are only available in England. Uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland will of course have to take their own approach and uh, we still await to see how uh, they will approach that in terms of their grants 
Um, some of that will, of course, come from the devolved settlement grants uh, and the Barnet consequentials. So uh, the devolved administrations are working their way through that at the moment, and we'll bring an update to you on that as we can do. In relation to the recovery loan scheme, this is the replacement for bounce back loans, C bills and CL bills, um, which come to an end on the 31st of March. So last applications for those uh, continued at the 31st of March. The new recovery loan scheme will provide facilities for term loans and overdrafts between 25,000 and 10 million pounds per business with invoice finance and asset finance facilities being between 1,000 and 10 million pounds per business. The term loans, the, the, the term of those facilities will be up to six years for asset finance and term loans and up to a maximum of three years for overdraft and invoice finance. Similar to B, uh, bounce back and C-bills, et cetera, the government will provide uh, a, a guarantee, this time at 80%. And again, similar to, to those other loans, there will be no personal guarantees uh, for any facility up to 250,000 and no security will be able to be taken over principal private residencies. Unlike the previous schemes, interest fees and payable will be wholly payable for, uh, by the business from day one. Um, so not like the uh, say bounce back and C-bills, et cetera, where there was the, the 12 month payment by government to start off with. And the new recovery loan scheme will be available uh, for applications from the 6th of April uh, with the intention that that will close at the end of 2021. Again, the link for the uh, information on that scheme is on the slide and will be available for you to, to download later on. In relation to hospitality, hospitality accommodation and attractions, uh, the reduced rate VAT has been extended. Uh, that was due to end at the end of March. So the 5% extension uh, reduced rate has been extended through to the 5th of September. There will then be a transitional rate of 12.5% from October through to March 2022. And thereafter, it will revert to standard rate VAT on those. As far as we know, that it will be the uh, same businesses that are eligible under the current scheme. Uh, it's just an extension of the, uh, the, the, the dates and the rates. Turning now to business rates, um, we have uh, it, uh, the announcement yesterday, again, uh, applied only to England um, for retail, hospitality, leisure and nurseries. There is 100% uh, business rates relief uh, extended through to the 30th of June. So that's for the first three months of the, the fiscal year. And thereafter, there will be a 66% reduction uh, for the remainder of that year. There are various caps uh, in place also, um, depending upon which um, property or, or, or which business is required to close and when they were required to close. I think it's also just worth point out, pointing out that the uh, Scottish government have already announced that there will be non-domestic rates relief for retail, hospitality, leisure, and also aviation. Um, and that will be for the, the full fiscal year of 2021-22. The difference as far as we can uh, ascertain is that in Scotland, certainly you will require to apply for that relief through the local authorities. Whereas as, as far as we can see in England, that relief will be given automatically to the relevant businesses. Turning now finally to corporation tax and uh, new rates from 2023 with the main rate of corporation tax uh, being increased to 25%. Uh, new small profit rate, uh, those are for profits of less than 50% being introduced or being retained at 19%. And then there will be taper relief for uh, businesses with profits between 50,000 and 25,000 uh, pounds in there as well. Some other uh, measures which affect uh, companies and businesses, the extended loss carryback has been increased from one year to three years. So for non-group companies, um, they will be able to carry back uh, up to two million pounds of losses. Um, during 2021 
and 2022 years. And for group companies, the, the two million pound losses uh, will be across the group. However, individual companies with losses up to 20,000 pounds will be able to carry back those losses without affecting the group limitations. And the final matter, which um, really only affects companies, um, just to, to, to clarify that, is in relation to what was called the super deduction during the budget speech yesterday, which is essentially the 130% capital allowances uh, for companies who are investing in qualifying plant and machinery. Um, and that will be during the period April 2021 to March 2023. So that covers most of the, um, the, the, the main COVID measures that were announced yesterday, with the exception, of course, of the coronavirus job retention scheme and the self-employed um, income support scheme. So we will now turn our attention to those. Do please continue to ask your questions throughout the Q&A. Um, and once we've heard from Justine, we'll uh, look at some of the questions that have come in. I can see there's already a few questions uh, ha have arrived in, so we'll have a look at those. Um, but uh, Justine, over to you now, first of all. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, OK, so I'm just going to go to my first slide, which just explains what I'm going to be going through this morning. Um, in my enthusiasm, um, earlier, I did list quite a few different things that I wanted to talk about, but um, we're not going to have time to discuss them all today. So the ones with asterisks next to them at the bottom of the list, uh, they will be included in the slides that, that are going to be available on uh, the download after this webinar is finished. And um, I'm going to run through them in my next webinar, which I'm doing with Dawn Dixon from Evershed Sutherland on the 18th of March. So we'll cover them off properly then. Um, so let's move on. So <clears throat> CJRS extension then. So the budget 2021 measures, uh, Rishi Sunak yesterday announced that they, CJRS will be extended to the end of September 2021. Um, and the table there, which is from HMRC, explains it quite clearly. But essentially, um, the government contribution in May and June will be 80% up to a cap of 2,500, as has been the case up until now. And um, then in July, that contribution drops to 70%, but the employer still has to pay 80. That, so that means they need to contribute 10%. Um, in addition, of course, to the pension contributions and the employer's national insurance. And then in, in August and September, that drops down to a 60% contribution from the government and the, the employer's contribution to that, to that salary goes up by 20%. And obviously, the, that means that the employer can claim that amount back from the government, the 80, 70 and 60 but they must pay at least 80% to the employee at all times. And obviously they're free to top it up as before 200% if they want to, uh, but they're not forced to. So the eligibility criteria for that, um, the 1st of May, 2021 onwards, eligible employees must have been employed on the 2nd of March. So the day before the budget announcement, um, and the real-time information submission, which counts for that purpose, um, has got to be submitted with those employees on it between the 20th of March um, and the 2nd of March 2021. Okay, so I'll just move on. So there's been a lot of uh, talk about these naming lists that have been uh, put out there, published by HMRC, which tell everyone uh, they're published on gov.uk and they tell everyone who which employers out there have been actually claiming CJRS from the 1st of December 2020 and that was part of an initiative which uh, the treasury wanted to to the HMRC to publish the list as part of its transparency agenda so they put out a direction to HMRC to start publishing names so um, 
In January 2021, the names of the claimant employers were published. Um, but to fulfill the Treasury direction requirements, HMRC was supposed to publish a little bit more detail than that. So uh, now from February, the names and the company registration numbers were applicable and the bandings in which that, that employer has fallen in terms of how much money they have claimed um, under CJRS will be, have been published already. Um, and that will continue on a monthly basis now. Um, employers can seek uh, to be exempt from being published on the list, but only where they consider that they are at serious risk of violence or intimidation. Um, it wasn't the case originally that agents could apply for exemptions on behalf of employers, but from February onwards, they can. So I've put a, a link there um, in case anybody needs to apply on behalf of their client for an exemption. And the exemptions, when, when you apply for an exemption, the exemption applies from the next cycle of publication. So if you're halfway through February when you apply the, if, and you are successful, in obtaining an exemption, then the exemption will apply from March. So the employees can also check now whether they've been included in a CJRS claim. It's a it's kind of pincer movement by HMRC, I guess. Um, to they, So they can look on their personal tax account. If they don't have a personal tax account, they can register for one and the details should be already pre-populated on there of what um, claim they've been included in. Uh, if they work for more than one employer, there should be more than one employer displayed on there. Uh, the personal tax account detail also asks the employee to speak to the employer, which might be a difficult conversation, if something looks odd or Alternatively, they can make a fraud report to HMRC if, for example, um, they were asked to work, but, but they've been included in a furlough claim. So if they consider that there's been a, any fraudulent activity, they can report that to HMRC. And just a quick comment on digitally excluded employees. Uh, instead of putting the details on the personal tax account, the digitally excluded team at HMRC will be contacting digitally excluded employees separately. Okay. So I'll just have a quick look at HMRC's compliance activity at the moment. Um, I've had a few meetings with HMRC recently about what they're doing on CGRS compliance. Obviously the, the emphasis is on fraud. Um, the, they are taking um, a fairly stiff approach to, to fraud. As we've seen, they've published uh, details already of some high profile arrests that have been made. That effort is going to continue. And we do know that, uh, well, in the budget, it was mentioned yesterday that additional resources are going to be, to be put on, on there as well. So, um, you know, that's, that's basically what they're up to there. Um, they have continued to say that they are going to take a light touch approach to employers where they can see that the mistakes that have been made have been completely genuine, made in error, etc. Also, the compliance activity from HMRC is going to be quite heavily focused um, after April on the new construction industry scheme scheme regime uh, where the new rules have come in. I, I think I went through uh, the new aspects of that in the last webinar that we did. Unfortunately for uh, everybody concerned, even though the, the new rules are coming in from the 6th of April 2021, the draft legislation and guidance still hasn't been published. Um, you may or may not know that, that I co-chair the construction forum with HMRC so I've seen the draft legislation, although it's not published yet, and the guidance, I'm expecting to see that next week. And we're feeding back on that and giving them commentary on uh, amendments and um, things that don't make sense or, or that employees might, uh, em, sorry, employers and con contractors might not actually understand. So uh, 
watch this space. I mean, it's uh, dreadfully late, but uh, we are where we are. We've just got to accept it. Um, and also off payroll working, which I'll be going through in my uh, next webinar <clears throat> from the 6th of April, 2021 is coming in. HMRC issued a policy paper. So I've put a link to that for anyone that's interested. Uh, the draft guidance, again, has still not been published. Um, there's a tax uh, impact and information notice that is has been published. Um, and also there's a targeted anti-avoidance uh, rule, which will be coming out and will be effective from the 6th of April. So that's really all we know about that at the moment. So I uh, just wanted to tell you about a couple of things that, uh, well, I suppose I'm quite proud of really because uh, ICAS has been instrumental in obtaining these changes to the benefit in kind rules. Um, so these are concerned with uh, income tax exemptions for employer reimbursed COVID-19 tests. So this is where the employee goes out um, and gets a test but uh, they've paid for it themselves and the employer then reimburses them for it. And due to the lockdown procedures, et cetera, many, many employers and employees have been affected by this because uh, vouchers uh, suddenly, paper vouchers, that is, suddenly became unacceptable. So uh, it did prevent quite a lot of employers from, uh, from paying for tests directly. So... Um, what we did, we spoke to HMRC and said that it would be unreasonable for this to be included in the benefits code um, and taxed as a benefit in kind just because it's been reimbursed to the employee. Um, so HMRC have agreed that that was entirely reasonable suggestion. So they've uh, set up a retrospective exemption for 2021. So if someone makes a reimbursement to an employee uh, for the for a coronavirus antigen test, uh, then it's exempt for that year. And obviously it's exempt for NI as well because the NI treatment mirrors the tax treatment. So uh, we've also obtained an, an exemption for 21-22 on similar grounds. And I've also there just put a note at the bottom of the slide about where employers are directly providing the test and it's not reimbursed. So that's also exempt um, and there's no class 1A national insurance on it either. So there's a few links there for you to, for you to look at uh, if, if it interests you. Um, so I'll just move on to working at home. Um, another one where ICAS has been instrumental in obtaining some common sense um, outcomes. Basically, we're, we're talking to HMRC practically for the whole of last year about uh, claiming tax relief um, for working at home where you've actually, where an employee has been told that they must work at home. Um, so what HMRC decided to do was to exempt um, tax relief claims on working at home expenses for the whole tax year, regardless of how long the employee has been working from home, which is really good news. Um, I've listed a few of the additional variable costs that, that might uh, qualify for a tax relief there. So essentially what um, the employee can do, there's two choices. People who work at home all the time, who work at home permanently as part of their normal contract of employment are entitled to, to claim tax relief or receive a tax and NIC free um, round sum allowance on their pay. Um, currently, six pounds a week or 26 pounds a month, where you don't need any receipts or any evidence. You just need to have it in you, you know, that you're working from home. So where an employee has been asked to work from home under COVID, they can also claim um, tax relief on that amount. Of money uh, or alternatively of course the employer can choose to pay them that amount 
Um, but if they don't, they can claim the tax relief on it and they can claim it for the whole year. Um, and the alternative to that is that the employer employee can claim tax relief on the actual costs if those are above the the flat rate amount that's that's uh, available so then of course they would need evidence they'd need receipts and everything else so they'd be able to submit those to hmrc with a tax relief claim and they'd get tax relief at their marginal rate so that's that's also good um and I've also put a link there to any additional equipment that an employee may have had to go out and buy um, because they couldn't sit scrunched up on the sofa or, or um, a dining table or something like that for a year. So uh, if they've had to go out and buy something like a laptop or an office chair or something, um, they can potentially also claim tax relief on that, which is great. So I just want to highlight something that came up um, during the course of last year, uh, termination payments and CJRS. And I'm highlighting it now because, um, you know, we are, we can possibly, <laughs> I'm, I'm an optimist, we can see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, the CJRS is coming to an end, we're, we're told, at the end of September. But what will happen after that, we're not sure in terms of, job losses in terms of business continuity plans, et cetera, et cetera. We already know that 700,000 people have lost their jobs because Rishi told us that yesterday. Um, and that's in spite of all the assistance that's been on offer. Um, but the OBR have down, uh, they've forecasted down the unemployment figures uh, for this year from about 11% to about 6%. So um, maybe things aren't, looking as bad as, as we originally thought. But what there was uh, in, in, in terms of the termination payments legislation, there was a little bit of a loophole because uh, employers were asked by the government if they did have to make people redundant, um, that they should be using their original pay uh, level, the reference pay, the contractual pay uh, when making a termination payment and calculating the post-employment notice pay or PEMP. Um, and there was a bit of a loophole because employers weren't technically forced to use that by the government. So a lot of employers didn't. And when they were making termination payments, they were using the furlough level of pay rather than the original reference pay, which was deemed to be unfair. So from the 31st of July, 2020, a new law was issued, which prevented employers from doing that um, so if you weren't aware of that that is the case and it has been from July last year uh, so if anybody is considering changing their workforce or, or lowering the headcount from now onwards then that is is still in force um, so they must use the reference pay for all elements um, where there's no set working hours, the employer must average 12 weeks pay to calculate the notice pay and the redundancy pay. I've put a notice here at the bottom. Employers cannot claim wages paid during the notice period under CJRS after the 30th of November 2020. Um, and they should never have claimed redundancy payments or payments in lieu of notice as part of the CJRS claim anyway. So that's just a little note there. Um, so just a quick uh, run through of what to do where somebody doesn't have any fixed working hours. Um, so numbers one to three, that's the information that you always need if you're, if you're making a redundancy payment. Um, and the third one is um, the value of the employee's weekly pay. So for somebody with no fixed working hours, weekly pay is the last 12 full weeks prior to the date of redundancy that they've actually been entitled to some remuneration. So if somebody's on a zero hours contract, 
there'll be weeks when they're not entitled to any remuneration because they haven't been offered any work. So what you have to do is look back at the 12 weeks prior to the date of redundancy that they have been entitled to some remuneration in. So that might go back longer, much longer than 12 weeks. So I have to include the weeks when they've been working, actually working, weeks when they've been furloughed because they're still entitled to remuneration and also paid holiday weeks. So the weekly pay is the average of the total remuneration over that period divided by 12. And um, the reference pay must be used for the weeks when they've been on furlough, not the furlough pay, as per the legislation that I mentioned earlier. So the weekly pay figure is then, of course, subject to the statutory redundancy pay cap, which for 2021 was £538. And just a note on what to do about notice pay or being paid in lieu, because the legislation defines these two elements very clearly when you're calculating um, post-employment notice pay, which is an extremely complicated issue these days. Um, I, I'm not going to go into detail in it in this presentation because I'm going to go through it in a bit more detail with Don Dixon in a couple of weeks time but essentially you have to differentiate between whether somebody is receiving a pay in lieu of notice payment or whether they're actually serving their notice because the dates of reference are different okay and there's a calculator which is set out uh, which is is governed by section 402d of itpa 2003 and there's a link to that there but essentially they are uh, if you have anything to do with termination payments, they are extremely complicated these days. So finally, I'm just going to run through um, just, well, I, I'm not going to run through it, actually, because uh, you guys can all, all read. So um, PCRT, Professional Conduct in Relation to Taxation, it's really just to reinforce uh, with members that... Um, Professional conduct in relation to taxation is uh, a way of keeping you all safe um, from straying outside of your what may be your normal area of practice and doing something that you've never, ever done before. Um, it might be better to call in an expert, speak to an employment lawyer, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'm going to leave it there and uh, pass you over to Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, Justine, actually, I think we'll, we'll, we'll just come back to myself just for a, a, a wee second, okay. first of all. Um, we're just going to have a, have a look at a few of the questions that, are, that have come in at the moment. Um, there, there's been a couple of questions come in in relation to the, the super deduction and the, the capital allowances, um, essentially looking for clarity around um, what qualifies for, 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 for that. Um, I think the answer to that is it's essentially new assets, so i.e. they can't be, or as far as we're, we're aware, we're assuming that that definition is they cannot be second-hand assets purchased um, in, in, in that situation. So it talks about new assets, um, and it's essentially what would be covered under your, your main pool uh, plant machinery uh, assets that's, that's going to qualify for that. As with a lot of these things, you know, we're going to have to wait until we actually see the the, the actual legislation um, to get the absolute full details. But certainly in terms of the policy paper uh, that's been issued, it appears to be new assets, uh, what would qualify under main pool um, and would exclude things like intangible assets, uh, that sort of thing that, that, that would qualify for, for, for that. Um, I've also had a question in around the, um, the recovery loan scheme and uh, if somebody has taken out a bounce back loan or a CBILS loan, are they also able to, to take out a recovery loan scheme loan? Uh, the answer to that is that they are not ineligible for it, so they're not automatically um, excluded from it. I think the point that we need, need to make is that some of the conditions are that it will be the lender's normal um, lending conditions, so credit checks, etc., that need to be uh, applied to that as well. So there's no absolute prohibition 
um, if you have taken out a bounce back loan or CBOS loan, you're able to take out the, the further loan under recovery loan scheme, but always subject to passing the lender's uh, normal lending conditions um, on that as well. Um, just a question, I guess, that's coming for, for you, Justine. Um, perhaps if we uh, look at one of those just now, uh, questions come in that where a company has employees currently on furlough or flexible furlough, uh, but they want to employ a, a new uh, member of staff, perhaps in a business development role or something while continuing to furlough existing employees. Are there any restrictions on that? Uh, as far as you're aware? No, not as far as I'm aware. Um, I don't think that there's anything that stops people from recruiting people. Um, and it, it's you're furloughing people, um, choosing to furlough them in the parts of the business that aren't currently operating, presumably. So if you need to recruit somebody because a part of your business is operating, I don't think that prevents, there's nothing that prevents you from doing that. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's certainly my understanding of it as well. And I guess, you know, we, we we're certainly aware or there's been clarity issued uh, recently around you're allowed to furlough members of staff, uh, not only because of your business reasons, but because of their reasons as well in terms of uh, childcare issues and, 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 and yeah. such like uh, a, a, as well. So there's certainly nothing inherent within the, uh, the CGRS scheme that, that I'm aware of that stops you also employing new members of staff um with that obviously wider employee uh, implications uh, may uh, or employment law implications may may affect that and we would suggest that you take uh, appropriate employment legal advice uh, yep. particularly if you're employing uh, within the the same area so if you already have somebody on uh, furlough who's already carrying out that business development role yep it might be worthwhile just taking employment advice on that, especially if slightly further down the line, you end up in the position where um, you, know, you, you end up having to perhaps make one of them redundant. Uh, it's worthwhile just, just thinking that, that through in the, in the short term as well. Um, the other um, question yep. that, that, that's come in, I think is uh, worthwhile talking about at the moment, uh, just briefly is in relation to the work from home relief. Um, and the question around that is, what's the risk that in future HMRC uh, say that principal private residence relief uh, is restricted because part of the home was worked in for say 18 months. So it's no longer essentially a, a small temporary provision, it's become a much longer term provision. Um, and I guess, you know, in, as we perhaps look to returning to, to normal working and uh, there's going to be changes perhaps in the way that people work um you know they're no, maybe no longer going to be going yeah. back into offices um and uh, uh, and such like some some thoughts around that justine yeah lots of uh, different thoughts around that actually um and it does the, the ppr relief has always centered around whether you have a specific area of your house that's um exclusively used for business purposes and, um, and, and that's also, to be honest, that's also the case for council tax purposes as well. Um, because if you, if you have some sort of area of your house that's exclusively used for, for that and nothing else whatsoever, um, then, you know, there are implications there as well. But um, I think that HMRC would probably want to take a fairly relaxed view at the moment in terms of people working from home because we're in COVID, because we're in a pandemic, those that view may change over time um, in terms of whether people return. Do they ever return to the office afterwards? Um, will they just continue to work from home? What will the situation be? And, and that should be reflected in people's employment contracts, actually. If, if the situation has changed, then the contract should change and reflect the, the new terms and conditions of that employment, which is that that employee is home based, because that will also affect their travel and subsistence expenses if they are required to travel on business. Uh, you know, like I work from home permanently. When I leave the house to go to London for a meeting, I claim my expenses from my house to London and back again. I don't go have to go to the office 
office or, or anything like that. So there's, there's lots of different things that come into it, but I can't see there being a hard line from HMRC on that at the moment, but it will have to come out in the wash. Yep. And I think it's worthwhile, you know, it's, it's always uh, about planning for, you know, those sorts of things. And I think thinking in, in advance and having those discussions around yeah. that with, with, with your clients is, is something that's worthwhile. Justine, thank, thanks very much for, for, for that at the moment. We'll uh, come back. I know we've not covered all the questions that have come in at the moment. Um, but at this point, I do want to bring uh, Jeremy in to cover the other topic. Uh, the other main topic of, of the webinar today in terms of the self-employed income support scheme. We will, of course, come back to uh, some questions afterwards uh, after Jeremy spoke to us. So, uh, Jeremy, I'll pass over to you just now. Thank you. Thanks very much, David, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, this is the updated update on the update on SEIS, um, which uh, I'm not sure how many updates we're going to have, but um, let's just get stuck in. Uh, this slide, I should have um, had a four at the top of that. So I'm going to deal with SEIS um, SS4, first of all, and then five um, after that. Um, so this should be SEIS4, what we now know. And I, I put the emphasis on the now there because this has obviously been trailed before. We knew it was coming, but we didn't have any detail on it really. Um, we had a sort of skeleton outline, but we now have the detail after the um, Chancellor's statement yesterday. Um, the bits that are in grey, we, we knew that. The bits that are in blue are little additions to it. So um, slightly different condition this time um, than previously. Moved on from reduced demand to a significant financial impact due to coronavirus. And I'll actually come back to that in a couple of slides time because it's, it's not even that straightforward. Um, we knew it was an 80% uh, grant, um, a one lump instalment, we presume, although that hasn't been confirmed. Um, the 50% income rule still applies, still subject to tax and NI, capped at 7,500. Um, but the, the interesting bit, and we've actually already had a couple of uh, emails from members about this, um, you must have filed your 2020 tax return by midnight um, the day before yesterday. Um, and that excludes a lot of people. There was a huge trumpeting um, that this you know, move, this new SEIS grant, um, would bring in about 600,000 people that couldn't previously claim. Um, that's the government's estimate. Other estimates bring it in at about 400,000. So that's about two thirds of what the government say. And actually, um, whatever way you look at it, it still leaves between 2.4 and 2.6 million people that can't claim this at all. So um, I'm not sure it's quite such a, a wonderful um, success as, uh, as they were trumpeting, if you like, on the 600,000. Now, um, the point on this is that you, got an extension um, to file your tax return um, and that wasn't bang on the 2nd or sorry on the 3rd of March so um, it just doesn't seem quite fair quite right and, and, and will exclude a lot of people who are in the process um, have been granted an extension to file their tax return because they're struggling with COVID related issues and whatever um, and that's going to prevent them from claiming this grant it just seems a bit nuts. Um, the other thing is, which uh, I think has already caused some comment um, in the, the national press and whatever is, that um, the service will be available from late April until the 31st of May, so a six week window, uh, that's not the real issue. The issue is that they're not going to get this money until probably May, because late April means uh, processing time and whatever, they're not going to get the money until May, so they've got another couple of months where self-employed people are sitting um, just with no money coming in. Uh, it just seems a bit mad. Um, the conditions are largely the same as previously, but they've snuck in another couple of ones and they actually don't all make sense. So the first one is you must have traded in both tax years. Um, so you must have traded in 2020, but also in 21. But we went into lockdown just after Christmas. So how can you trade in 21 um, what are they going to do about that? We, we can only hope that they're going to um, take a sensible 
approach to that because there will be many businesses that didn't restart before the 5th of April. Um, so, you know, we really, really need to get a bit of clarity on that, but that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you must either be currently trading or um, not being trading, unable to do so, you know, temporarily. That's the same condition as previously. Um, and you must declare an intention to continue to trade, which was there before, and a reasonable belief that there was a significant reduction in trading profits. I think that, that's probably not unfamiliar to us. Um, so uh, just an, another couple of bits of information. Um, as before, HMRC will write to taxpayers that they believe um, are eligible for this, and they will provide what they nicely call a personal claim date. Um, which is the earliest date at which that particular taxpayer can claim. They're presumably still going to have to do it themselves. You won't be able to do it for them. And um, the interesting bit is this next point. Um, so previously I mentioned the definition or the, um, the, the eligibility criteria, which was a significant financial impact due to coronavirus. Now that is... Um, from one source that is available to taxpayers. But there's another source that is going to be available to agents, which gives a def different definition, which is an honest assessment that there has been a significant reduction in trading profits due to reduced demand or inability to trade. Quite different things. And it's interesting that they've put in that word there, or those two words, an honest, three words, an honest assessment honest assessment. That's the first time in anything I've ever seen come out from HMRC that uses that. You know, they're, they're actually going to the honesty of it, which I think is quite interesting, quite telling. And it'll, it will be um, interesting to see how that develops so over the um, next few weeks when the actual legislation comes out. And the other thing is uh, first time claimants, um, there might be identi additional identification requirements. And interestingly, the list of those requirements includes a P60 um, and your three most recent pay slips. Go figure. Um, so moving on to SEIS 5, um, what we know now, and again, the emphasis on the now, because we haven't seen the, uh, the actual Treasury directive, so we don't know the detail of this really. This is just what we've picked up from a number of government sources um, as of now today. Um, so it covers the 1st of May to the 30th of September. Um, we presume, like all the others, it will be a, a one lump instalment, but we don't know. Um, and it's based on three months average trading profits. I'll come to that in a wee minute. It's turnover based, so it, it's determined by how much your turnover has been reduced in the year April 2020. To April 21. Um, and again, there's that condition that you must have filed um, your tax return, your 2020 tax return by the 3rd of March. Um, again, subject to income tax, the online claim service will be available from late July, so you probably won't get your money until August, um, and further details will be published in due course. So, um, a couple of interesting things. It's an Oliver Twist moment. Please, sir, I want some more. What? No. Um, the government announces, and this is a, a direct quote, the government announces that there will be a fifth and final SEIWS grant covering May to September. Um, and the, the question that immediately sprang into my mind is, what if a new variant comes along and this horrible situation continues? They've effectively shut the door on any more support after the fifth grant to self-employed people. It will be a fifth and final SEIWS grant. Now, they may come up with some other variant and not call it an SEIWS grant, but that seems to be indicating that support for self-employed will not continue. There was no such definitive final finality um, in respect of CJRS, which... Um, it seems a bit strange. Um, and there is a sting in the tail here. We went back and I was quite careful about how I worded the, the basis of this. So it applies. It's a turnover test now. It's moved away from sort of quite nebulous type 
um, things down to a specific, your turnover has to go down and it has to have gone down by more than 30% in order to get 80% um, of your trading profits, your average trading profits. And as before, it's capped at 7,500. If your turnover is down by less than 30%, then you'll only get 30% of your trading profits. And that's capped at 2,850 pounds, which generously is not actually um, a third of that. I think it's a third of 80%. So anyway, um, but it's now a turnover test. It's now very, very specific. 30% or more, then you'll get it. You're fully 80%. Less than that, you only get um, 30%. And it really is a wee bit bizarre. And I, I, I'm very conscious here that this is um, illustration purposes only. And please don't come back and say that I am indeed mixing apples and oranges because you've got the apples of turnover, um, which is the test, if you like, and the income you get from, from that and the oranges of the profit. And you know even the revenue are mixing two things here, apples and oranges. And this doesn't quite sit, you know, but you'll get the picture and what I'm saying here. So. Take the first scenario where you're at the extremes, okay? Your turnover is down by 100%. In that case, you'll receive zero turnover because your turnover is down 100%, but you'll qualify for 80% of your profits. So in a sense, you know, if, if the two were the same, you would be getting 80%. But if your turnover is down by 1%, you would get 99% of your income and 30% of your profits roughly 129%. So if your turnover is down totally, you do, um, you're worse off if you like than if your turnover is down a little. Um, the other scenario, when you get closer to the 30% margin, if you like, the, the, the cutoff, um, if your turnover is down just 1% over, then you will receive 69% of your, your turnover and 80% of the grant. So you'll get 149%. But if your turnover is down by, you know, if you miss it by 1% and it's down by 29%, you'll receive 71% of your turnover and 30% of the grant, which is near enough 101%. So it flips and it just doesn't make sense. It's absolutely, I just think it's a little bizarre. It's weird. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether they thought this through terribly well, but it just doesn't seem terribly consistent or terribly fair. Um, and there's, all right, I, there we go. And um, yeah, uh, so, so the, the, the message again, I think is that if you're self-employed, it's hard cheese because there's still nothing for personal service um, companies for directors of, um, you know, or manage businesses if you like and um, if you're not employed you're self-employed I showed this slide um, a wee while ago there was essentially a gap um, in the September and October last year where the self-employed got no assistance at all and it's the same again this time because if you note back that the um, the grant applies for May to September that's five months but you're only getting three months profits and 80% of it or 30% of it. So there's still, there's another two months in that where you're not getting any support. Um, doesn't, doesn't seem terribly fair to me. And finally, um, just a sort of how the, the goalposts have moved. And this is obviously the revenue trying to firm up and reduce fraud as they see it. And um, so in one and two, we had adversely affected. Then we moved to SEI double S3 with reduced demand. Four, we now have this honest assessment um, of, of a significant reduction in trading profits. And then in five, we go into a turnover test. So it's like, woo, let's move it again. Um, absolutely. Um, just, you know, get your head around it again. We have to work out how another set of rules, if you like, is, is going to apply. Um, one final point, there's another sting in the tail, and this is the no longer eligible um, issue. Um, I'll let you read that, but the important bit is that where a recipient of an SEIS double, SEI double S grant stops being entitled to keep all or part of the grant due to a change in circumstances, a tax charge equivalent to the amount of the grant can be recovered. In other words, if your circumstances change, they can get it back. 
and no detail of how this is going to work. So does this mean when your business picks up, then you're no longer eligible, you've got to pay it back? Um, or what happens if you get a job in the course of um, the lockdown or whatever, they, you know, because you have to you know, pay the mortgage and feed the kids? Is that what they mean? We, act, we don't know. But what we do know is that they're putting in the ability um, to get it back if your circumstances change. So um, it seems that the compliance work might be um, even more than we thought previously. So that's all I've got for now, David. Thank you. Um, Thanks very much, Jeremy. Loads of questions. <laughs> yes, lo lots and lots of questions coming in um, and we are already short on time. So I'll probably just uh, fire through some of, the, some of these questions and uh, perhaps if we can try and keep answers relatively brief uh, it might not entirely be possible with, with all of them um, but I suspect if we don't manage to get through all the questions then of course we will do a Q&A document and put that on the website to to, to, to cover all, all, all of them. Um, I, I think in, interestingly almost the, I think it was the second last slide that you had there uh, Jeremy was around the the moving goalposts um, and that ties in in, in, in some ways with uh, some of the, or at least one of the questions uh, that, that's come in, which was essentially as agents, do we have a responsibility to check eligibility for uh, SEI SSS claims? I think your clients are going to expect you to, um, but they're the ones that make the claims and therefore it's, it's ultimately their responsibility and you're, you're only ever acting as an agent and if your principal overrules you, if you like that so slightly, but I think, you know, as a profession, we have an obligation to try and keep our clients on the right lines. Um, and that would probably mean um, having the discussion with them. Um, I, think, I think that's entirely, and obviously, you know, as you've demonstrated there, the, the criteria is is not the same for, for all, the, all the grants. And therefore somebody having already claimed a grant does not necessarily mean that they're entitled to the next one. Correct. So I think it is really around that discussion with uh, with clients and making sure that they are aware of the, the changing criteria uh, as, as, as that has, has, has gone on. Yeah. Um, so yeah, ab absolutely with that one. Um, I'll just have a look down through. Another one that's come in is, even if you've suffered a significant financial impact, would you still be entitled to claim if say you just received a large inheritance and therefore you're, you're not necessarily um, in need of it, but you uh, you meet the eligibility criteria in terms of turnover reduction and such like. Yeah, I, th I think the answer to that would be yes. You would be. I mean, your 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 external um, criteria, your external circumstances, if you like. I don't think the test applies to that. You know, if it, if you satisfy the terms of the test, then I think you you can claim it. Yep, and um, just another one. Uh, SEI SSS 3, there was a condition that you must be confident your business will continue into the future. Uh, I think the, the exact wording was you must declare that you intend to continue to trade. Is that the same for 4 and 5? It's certainly the same for 4 um, because one of the, I'm just looking at my notes, uh, yep, you've got to be able to declare that there is an intention to continue to trade. Um, so definitely for four not in there for five but you would kind of assume it will be yeah okay justine just coming back to, to to you for a second um one of the um yeah. criticisms i guess of cgrs uh in the past has always been around new employees coming in and uh you know as it's been extended they have perhaps been excluded because of the the entry date criteria uh, that, that, that's there. Um, I think this was was covered in uh, in the presentation. In any case, but I'll I'll just ask it for uh, just for clarity. Is there a, a change to the date employees need to have been employed on? Um, so, I if you hired somebody now in January, the previous uh, eligibility date I think it was the first of October. Um, so, if you've taken on somebody new, will they now be able to be furloughed? Um, you know, through to the end of of October. Uh, in, in that situation? Yeah, um, as long as they are there by the 2nd of March and they're on the real-time information return that goes in um, 
I think I said on the 20th of March, I don't have the slide in front of me, but I think that's the date. Uh, as long as they're on that real-time information return, then a claim can be made for them. Do you think that's uh, that date of 20th of March is likely to uh, be changed? You know, obviously between now and uh, September or October time, uh, you know, there could be a number of new staff getting taken on as um, businesses reopen, uh, have to rehire staff, you know, particularly hospita hospitality retail. And you know, as Jeremy says, we don't know what's down the line. There could be a new variant. There could be new lockdowns. Um, do you think HMRC yeah. may consider at that point further down the line um, changing that date? Um, it, it's difficult to say, obviously, but I think, you know, they have changed things as time has gone by to try and accommodate people. But what we do have is a 2nd of March cutoff date purely because the budget was delivered yesterday, the 3rd of March. So they had to have a cutoff date of the day before for, you know, anti-avoidance stuff, you know, forestalling, whatnot. Um, the 20th is significant because that's the date when people have got to submit their real-time information returns by. So, you know, it's always going to be round about the 20th of every month when you've got to submit, you know. Um, and so as long as they're on that return for March, then, you know, th they can be included. But when you've got new employees being taken on, uh, are those new employees being taken on to work? Because if they are, they shouldn't be getting furloughed. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think, you know, I, I know it has been a concern for, for many businesses. I've uh, joined part of the, uh, the Scottish government's uh, COVID business uh, group uh, on, a, on a regular basis. And I know from our discussions there that uh, eligibility and being able to come back into furlough where you've taken on new employees is has been a concern for that. So I suspect that's something that we can uh, perhaps have a discussion with HMRC with and at least flag it up to them as still being a concern for, for, for business. Jeremy, just co coming back yeah. to you, um, say we are running out of time, so this might just be the, the, the last question that we have uh, in this live session. Um, but again, turning back, I guess, to eligibility for SEIWS, um, and the, uh, the requirement or the mistiming, I guess, between uh, having your, your tax return in um, and the extension that was allowed for, for tax return and then your, your eligibility uh, for, for, for four and five, et cetera. A um, couple of comments, I think, that have come in are, are around the unfairness of that um, and particularly, I guess, where somebody may well have uh, had a serious long-term COVID situation or something like that, and which has still prevented them from getting their 1920 tax return in. Um, again, just comments on that, and I guess you know about our, our ability to to sort of feed that back into to HMRC. I think it's one of many unfairnesses in the whole SEIWS thing, um, and it's just a particularly stark one, if you like. Um, it certainly is something that I think we will raise with HMRC um, because. Yeah, it does seem just absolutely nuts that you can have an extension in one point, but you know, when you really need it most, um, there's a potential that you you'll, you'll have that access cut off. So, um, by all, yes, definitely, it's something I think we will raise with them. Yeah, and there's been difficulties in getting UTRs as well, hasn't there? Yeah, um, which means it's difficult for you to actually make the claim. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, there's a few, a few, a few things round about that which um, we'll we'll be pressing. Yep, thank you. Uh, and I know I had said that 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 was the last question, but uh, I, I, Justine, just uh, coming back to you, um, just finally, obviously, uh, previously there had been um, the, the the job retention bonus, uh, oh, yeah. which had been um, mentioned by by the Chancellor in in, in previous statements that seemed to not get any mention at all during the budget yesterday. Um, no. Any, any views on that? Um, yeah, I mean, he it, it stayed silent on it, didn't he? It's not been published anywhere. There's been nothing, even though we did have a bit of a promise that, you know, towards the end of CJRS, uh, JRB would be reinstated. 
So I guess it's just a case of watch this space. At, you know, maybe something in October, uh, August, or, or early September might be announced in terms of a, you know, a, a kind of runoff because that's what job retention bonus is, isn't it? It's just a sort of runoff procedure. So maybe that, that will be it, or maybe it'll be, be a cliff edge. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows indeed. Jeremy uh, and Justine, thank you very much uh, for, for, for joining us this, this morning. As a, unfortunately, we, ha we have run out of time. We've started to run over a, a, a little bit and I'm obviously conscious uh, or that people watching uh, may well have other commitments and, and such like. As I say, we will have, or there, there clearly are a number of items which we will uh, pick up with, uh, with, with HMRC, our colleagues in uh, tax policy. Uh, well, obviously, they're uh, having, for instance, one-to-one -one discussions or follow-ups with, with HMRC uh, over the next few days on budget announcements. So all of these measures, we will, of course, pick up with them. Um, and we will we'll, uh, continue to, to, to come back, update you on those. We have our spring tax update uh, webinars uh, coming up in, in the not-too-distant future. So we'll be able to, to cover some of those then. Um, as I say, we do have a, a, a number of webinars uh, coming up uh, later on this afternoon. In fact, two o'clock this afternoon, uh, we have a, um, a, a, a budget update uh, webinar that you can still sign up with. And as Justine also mentioned, on the 18th of March, uh, we have the off payroll working uh, employment taxes and law update. Uh, next week, um, we also have the um, International Women's Day Ask ICAS, uh, sorry, ICAS Insights webinar on Monday. That's Monday the 8th of March. So lots of, of webinars coming up over the coming days and uh, weeks ahead. You can, of course, sign up to all of those at icas.com forward slash webinars. I say, unfortunately, we've not been able to get through all of the, the questions. We will uh, get back to individuals or uh, and also put them in a Q&A document, which we'll make available along with the slides and the on-demand webinar. Again, also available from icas.com forward slash webinars. So it only leaves me to once again thank Justine and Jeremy and indeed everyone for joining us uh, on today's webinar. I do hope that the, the webinar has been helpful to you. And but until the next Ask ICAS webinar in uh, two weeks time, uh, thank you very much for joining us and goodbye.